You might think you know everything there is to know about Henry VIII. You'll know he married six times and had two of his wives executed. But the truth about our most famous king is much more complex and far more compelling. This series tells Henry's story over six of the most tumultuous decades in English history, separating the real man from the myth. To some, Henry was a cruel bully. Henry was self-obsessed, desired admiration. He could never be wrong. He wanted the theater of punishment to be perfect. This is what happens when you defy Henry. To others, he was a charismatic and successful ruler. He jousts, he rides, he sings. What more could you want from this perfect prince? But Henry's personality, his innermost thoughts and his motivations have remained elusive. Today, we might call Henry a little bit OCD. It was said of him he couldn't hold somebody's gaze. He felt uncomfortable. Now, a team of Tudor experts have come together to investigate who the real Henry was. They'll unearth never-before-seen documents, including some from the Vatican's archives. Thank you so much for showing me one of the greatest prizes in Tudor history. And they'll go backstage at Henry's court to unravel a murky world of power, plots, and petrifying ambition. The Tudor court is a bear pit. It's an aggressive and violent place. When somebody is no longer useful to him, that's it, he cuts them out. It's almost pathological. He was willing to change the entire country, even the entire map of Europe, in order to get what he wanted. Henry VIII is born on the 28th of June, 1491. But he's never meant to be king in the first place. He's the spare heir, living in the shadow of his older brother, Prince Arthur. As the second son, the younger of the princes, comparisons could be made with Prince Harry. In fact, Henry was known as Harry for much of his childhood, and there are some similarities physically as well. He was allowed, really, to be a little bit wilder, to indulge his favorite pastimes. He just didn't have the same pressures as his elder brother. Henry clearly sees himself as the spare rather than the heir. Uh, I suppose in some ways that might be liberating, but in other ways it might nurture a certain jealousy. But Henry later in life has this urge to prove himself all the time, to show that he can be a success even at his most spare attendance. Spoiled him and made sure that the hard knocks and bruises of boyhood weren't inflicted on their charge. And anything he wanted, he got. As the second son, Henry is ignored by his father and instead raised by his loving mother in the protective female world of Eltham Palace. Henry's relationship with his mother was unusually close. His mother seems to have taken a real care for the education of her son. For a royal princess to grow up in this sort of environment wasn't that unusual. For a royal prince, however, it was a little bit strange, and it just goes to show how unimportant, really, Henry was considered in the line of succession. But when Henry is just 10 years old, something happens that transforms his life. Unexpectedly, his older brother dies, leaving him as heir to the throne. He's not but the second son, he's the first son, and he's going to be king of England. It's hard for us to imagine the pressure on him, the idea of having to take up that position. To make matters worse, Henry's beloved mother, Elizabeth of York, dies just months later. Recently, this remarkable survival from Henry's childhood has been revealed to us, and it's incredibly exciting, because for a long time, it was thought that this was just an old page and an illuminated manuscript. But when we look behind this figure of King Henry VII here, we see King Henry VIII, as he later became, as just a boy. This weeping child on the edge of an empty bed, that of his mother, he can't contain his emotion. His head is thrown into his arms in despair. We imagine Henry VIII as being someone that maybe didn't feel emotion, that wasn't affected by grief, but we can see in his reaction to his mother's death that it really broke his heart. 
He was now the heir to the throne and he didn't have his mother to guide him. He had instead a very different figure in his father, uh, a very problematic, I think, figure to try and move him into this new phase of his life. And I don't think that made it any easier for him. Henry's father, Henry VII, won the Wars of the Roses, a bitter civil war which lasted three decades and divided the kingdom. As the first Tudor king, he united the warring houses of Lancaster and York. But he now reigns over an unstable and uneasy peace. Paranoia was part of the Tudor DNA. The Tudors really had a rather tenuous, legally fragile claim. There is a seed of insecurity planted in Henry from a very early age. The political history of his father's reign has essentially been the history of plots and conspiracies hanging over from the wars of roses, who's in, who's out, who's being watched. Everything changes for Henry when he becomes next in line to the throne. He is now brought up directly by his controlling father after years of being sidelined. Henry's relationship with his father was really complex. There are lots of eyewitness accounts that Henry was never permitted to go out of the palace. He was kept to his rooms and that when he did appear at court, he never opened his mouth except to answer a question. This is so different to the upbringing that Henry had known. He must have felt like a virtual prisoner. As soon as Henry VIII is brought under his father's control, you see his personality just being squished, almost this overbearing weight of his father's anxieties, his paranoia, his concern that something might happen to this last vestige of the Tudor dynasty. As a very young boy, he hadn't really had much of his father's attention at all. But then, of course, suddenly, Henry had too much of his father's attention. He found it suffocating because Henry VII was trying to make up for lost time and kind of chisel this young, wild prince into a future king. Sometimes they argued quite violently in front of the court. On one occasion, a scandalized ambassador reported it looked the as if the king might murder his son. Little wonder, there was a deeply personal resentment against his father. After seven years of living under this harsh regime, Henry finally glimpses freedom. His father is now dying, and Henry has been summoned to see him one last time. He knows that in a few short hours, his father will be dead, and he will be king. This is a king who's dying, still not feeling anywhere near secure on his throne. He wants the Tudor dynasty to continue. So to his last breath, he's giving advice to his son how to secure the realm, what sort of advisors to surround himself with. He told Henry that he had to marry Catherine of Aragon, the widow of his elder brother Arthur, and he would rule England with her. It wasn't a sort of if or but. This is what you're going to do. And Henry meekly accepted it. Yes, At exactly an hour before midnight, Henry VII dies. In that moment, the 17-year-old Prince Henry... Henry's feelings about becoming king would have been a mixture of apprehension about what was going to happen. Would he be able to smoothly take over the levers of power, mixed with a wonderful sense of relief? that he was going to be his own man, his own master, and he could do things which he wanted to do instead of other people telling him. Remarkably, no one outside that room will hear there's a new king on the throne for two whole days. The story of what happened in that 48-hour period has intrigued historians for centuries. The next 48 hours will decide the fate of the kingdom. As soon as the old king dies, his closest courtiers start plotting. When Henry VII dies, there's essentially a court coup. His death is kept a secret for the best part of two days, while in the background they decide how to bring on this new regime with a splash. Henry played a full part in this 
complete cover-up of his father's death. Of course, he had a vested interest in it because he wanted to secure the throne. For Henry, this is his first real experience of the ruthless machinations of Tudor politics. The Tudor court is a bear pit. It's an aggressive and violent place. Your best friend can become your enemy, and your enemy can become your best friend. You need to be able to plan and plot your way through this vacuum of power. And in order to do that, you have to make sure that nobody knows the king is dead. Nobody has time to stage their own coup d'etat. He must have been affected by this atmosphere of intense fear and suspicion, not knowing who to trust, being very, very aware that actually the Tudors were a fragile dynasty. Henry is convinced that the biggest threat to his new reign is a rebellion coordinated by two of his father's most powerful advisors, Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley. Empson and Dudley were the sort of slick apparatchiks that Henry VII brought in to enforce his will, and they resorted to unsavory methods, rigging juries, accusing people of crimes they hadn't committed. Probably everybody disliked them. Early on the morning of the 24th of April, 1509, after 48 hours in limbo, Henry VIII is finally proclaimed king. But at the same time, he issues orders for the arrests of Empson and Dudley. Kemps and Dudley are scapegoats. They're convenient. You get rid of them, you appear to distance yourself from them. I think people had underestimated Henry before because they may have thought that he was merely a puppet that his father was controlling, but now Henry makes it very, very clear he's the one calling the shots. In the name of the king! You're coming with us! Get your hands off me! The arrests win the new king instant support with his people but it's likely that Henry has an ulterior motive. Henry VIII continued to resent his father for, for quite some time. He had had uh, lots of his own impulses suppressed for years and years, and because Henry couldn't do anything about it as long as his father was king, when he was gone, well, there's an opportunity with Empson and Dudley to play out his irritations, his frustrations with his father. Down the stairs! On the same day, Henry issues a groundbreaking piece of legislation, a general pardon. This extraordinary document sees Henry explicitly criticize his father's reign. What Henry is trying to do is to win popularity and quickly. So as well as getting rid of his father's despised ministers, he issues a general pardon to all of those who'd fallen foul of Henry VII's justice. So of course this makes him incredibly popular. People love him. Now, that pardon is basically rubbishing Henry VII. This is an extraordinary a move that you use your father's unpopularity to sell yourself to your subjects. Henry's telling his subjects that he knew they had suffered grievously through injustices imposed by his father, and he was happy to do all he could to right those wrongs. He wants to begin in a way that is going to make a break with the... Of course, it's all about reputation. It's all about this gleam in his eye that he's going to be a famous monarch, the best king that ever reigned in English history. Henry is determined to distinguish his father's reign from his own. But that doesn't stop him honoring his father's dying wish and marrying his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon, just seven weeks after he becomes king. Catherine is the most desirable bride in Europe, the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, the most mighty empire in the world at the time. But I think Henry really did love Catherine of Aragon. He professes himself to be deeply in love. It's part of those early grand gestures which, you know, he thinks he can make. But of course, he's also got an eye on security. And this is a monarchy, so it means dynastic security, so it means a son. His attempt to produce a male heir was pragmatic. He did not intend that the decades of conflict that had preceded his father's reign will continue into his reign. And he felt that... Producing a male heir soon comes true. On New Year's Day, 1511, Henry does have a son. Catherine of Aragon gives birth. Henry was beside himself with joy at having a son and heir. His hopes and dreams had been realized. But Henry's happiness is short-lived. His newborn son 
eyes at just seven weeks old. Henry doesn't seem to have responded very much at all to the news of his son's death. He does comfort Catherine, but there's no real sense from any of the chronicles or ambassador reports of this time that he is actually grieving himself. He is able to almost put a full stop on that child's life and move on from it. He has something intrinsic within him that he can just be cold, that he can shut down emotion. Throughout their marriage, Henry and Catherine will lose a total of six children. And Henry's anxieties about having a son and heir will intensify as the years go on. The big what if of Henry's reign is had that young Prince Henry who was born on New Year's Day 1511, had he survived, everything would have been different. Henry would have had that son and heir from the beginning of the reign. He would have had dynastic security. Maybe he would have relaxed a bit. When Henry lost his son, Henry, Duke of Cornwall, he was also losing the opportunity to pass on his crown to a legitimized male heir. He must have wondered at that moment whether that marriage could produce a male heir. After five years of marriage, Henry still doesn't have a son, and his new dynasty is beginning to show signs of vulnerability. To bolster his authority, he enlists the talents of a cardinal who has rapidly risen through the ranks at court. Cardinal Wolsey is a political genius, a little mastermind. He's Henry's fixer. And, you know, he does an incredibly good job. Of course, Wolsey was the man who would relieve him of all the tedious business of state. He's the guy who's going to help Henry fulfill his desires. If the king wants it, Wolsey will deliver it. Wolsey is a churchman, but let's just say he's not the sort of vicar that you'd sit down to tea and biscuits with. He likes the finer things in life. He insists on being served on golden plates. He surrounds himself by luxury. And he also has a few mistresses. He has at least one illegitimate child. Thomas Wolsey is somebody who's come from a relatively poor background. He's the son of a butcher, and people will make jokes about this throughout his career. He's risen up through the church to become somebody influential ideas into practice. For Henry, Wolsey becomes indispensable. Henry has always loved outdoor pursuits. And whilst he hunts, jousts and fights, the Cardinal takes all matters of state into his own hands. Henry in his 20s is often described as the most handsome prince in Europe. He was six foot one, stood above the other courtiers, and he certainly stood above the general populace. They could see him coming. One of the really important things about Henry and Wolsey's relationship is that Henry really does believe that Wolsey is his friend. They walk about together arm in arm in the King's Privy Garden. Wolsey can always walk in to see Henry. He doesn't need to make an appointment. Other ministers can't do that. Wolsey he sees a huge opportunity for himself here, and he takes it. According to most courtiers, he has absolutely no right to be there. He's of lowly birth. He's worked his way to the top, which is highly unusual. But Henry really doesn't have that same snobbishness that the rest of his court have. Within a few years, Henry raises Wolsey to become his chief counselor and one of his closest friends. Hidden away in the archives of the Vatican Library in Rome is a remarkable account written by a 16th century Italian diplomat, which reveals more about their relationship than anything else. The Vatican has never given permission for it to be filmed before. Well, thank you so much for showing me this work. This is the first time, though, that I've seen the original, so it's, it's an absolute privilege. This wonderful work, which is called Anglica Historia. It is about the history of England and uh, the king himself. Henry VIII, Arrigo VIII. The wonderful thing is, for a historian, is this, this is an eyewitness account yes. of yes. Henry VIII and his court. One of the best bits of his account is his description of Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, so Henry VIII's right-hand man. I mean, my Italian isn't great by any means, but I think in the page we have open here, it says what good fun Wolsey yes. was as well. He would sing and... and... It talked about him, cantava, saltava. 
smiled, jocava, he told jokes. So he would entertain and tell jokes and you can see the appeal of Wolsey for Henry, I think, from this account. At first glance, the document paints a picture of Wolsey as an entertaining member of Henry's court. But it's not what it first seems. It reveals that Wolsey has... ...is not at all flattering about Cardinal Wolsey and the methods he employed to manipulate his royal master. He describes him as a witty fellow uh, who would cling to the royal side, strum the lute, dance, indulge in pleasant conversation. He's almost doing his business by stealth. Henry doesn't realise all the things he's agreeing to and that by these methods he would inculcate, instill and drum into Henry's ears all of the messages that Wolsey wanted to get across. My favourite extract comes when he kind of lures Henry in by showing him a pretty jewel or a ring. It's almost like he's treating Henry like a child, tempting him with sweets, and Henry then just agrees to whatever the Cardinal asks of him. Henry's weakness for flattery and manipulation allows Cardinal Wolsey to rise to the highest echelons of court. But in a few short years, Henry will turn on his close friend and advisor with a vengeance. Henry VIII is worrying over the future of the Tudor dynasty. He still doesn't have a male heir, and he's surrounded by potential rivals to the throne. All his nightmares, all his problems, haven't gone away. They've just been like good wine, lying there, getting stronger and more powerful. As Henry gets into his 30s, we see little glimmers of paranoia to the extent that he has started to change his personality. He started to mistrust people around him. As his paranoia grows, Henry increases the provisions for his personal security. There is a quite extraordinary security service surrounding this king. His food is tasted before he's able to eat it. There's this elaborate ritual in order to put him to bed each night where the covers are checked for any knives in his bed. What effect that must have had on Henry because for all his confidence and his sense of invincibility, he's made very aware on a daily basis that really he's incredibly vulnerable. Henry's suspicions extend to the servants who surround him day and night. The barber is one of the very few people who are allowed close proximity to Henry. To be the royal barber means that you are holding a sharpened... You've killed a king, you've committed treason. And so, therefore, it's very clearly specified how a barber should be behaving, even what company they can these increasing provisions come from his paranoia and they also start to feed it because every single part of Henry's life was underscored with this sense of unease and suspicion about the people around him. Henry fears an uprising from a rival claimant to the throne and he hears a rumour that the Duke of Buckingham is secretly plotting against him. The Duke of Buckingham was the highest ranking nobleman in England and he had royal blood and lots of it. Henry is particularly suspicious of Buckingham because he doesn't make any secrets of his claim to the throne nor of his desire to be king. Henry's suspicions reach boiling point and he writes a letter to Cardinal Wolsey that seals Buckingham's fate. Henry's letter survives to this day and it's held here at the British Library. It's extremely exciting for me to see this original letter by Henry. There are, actually aren't many of them because, as Henry himself says here, he finds writing tedious and painful. He tends to entrust that time. Being stronger and more colourful. As Henry gets into his 30s, we see little glimmers of paranoia to the extent that he has started to change his personality. He started to... 
trust people around him. As his paranoia grows, Henry increases the provisions for his personal security. There is a quite extraordinary security service surrounding this king. His food is tasted before he's able to eat it. There's this elaborate ritual in order to put him to bed each night where the covers are checked for any knives in his bed. What effect that must have had on Henry, because for all his confidence and his sense of invincibility, he's made very aware on a daily basis that really he's incredibly vulnerable. Henry's suspicions extend to the servants who surround him day and night. The father is one of the very few people who are allowed close proximity to Henry. To be the royal barber means that you are holding a sharpened blade next to the King of England's throat. If you make one mistake, you've killed a king, you've committed treason. And so, therefore, it's very... ...is writing tedious and painful. He tends to entrust that task to scribes. So the fact this is in Henry's hand is hugely significant. This letter was intended for Wolsey's eyes only. It's top secret. So Henry is instructing Wolsey to keep good watch on the Duke of Buckingham. He effectively wants Wolsey to spy on Buckingham. He is Henry's prime target. He's the one he is most afraid of. Wolsey soon uncovers a whole raft of evidence that's enough to condemn Buckingham for treason. He's plotting rebellion. He's even stealing some of Henry's own servants and placing them in his household. Also, the thing that rankles most with Henry is that a monk has prophesied that Buckingham will be king. Well, for a man as paranoid as Henry, that really is going to be the nail in the coffin. Wolsey's investigation produces enough evidence for Buckingham to be found guilty of treason. And he is beheaded by an inept axeman who takes three strokes to cut through his neck. Henry's treatment of Buckingham is one of the earliest and most vivid indications of his brutality. This caused shockwaves across the kingdom. He wasn't going to suffer any hint of treason, even amongst the highest nobles of the realm. Fearing further plots against him, Henry's attitude to his noblemen changes. Henry starts to get rid of some of those older courtiers and counsellors who had surrounded him for a long time. He mistrusts some of the old nobility. They'll have agendas of their own. He replaces them with the promiscuous young aristocrats he grew up with, men he trusts. But with such a debauched entourage, Henry's palaces are transformed into houses of pleasure. Even though Henry joins in with all the fun, at heart, actually quite prudish. You can almost picture Henry the morning after walking through this scene of devastation with food strewn everywhere. There were people just sleeping on the floor wherever they could. Henry's a real contradictory character in all of this. On the one hand, he's encouraging this quite wild party atmosphere. But on the other, he's quite fastidious. I think, actually, today we might call Henry a little bit OCD for as much as he liked to project himself as a party Actually, he found it all deeply unsettling. The best evidence of Henry's controlling behaviour is contained in a little-known court document called the Eltham Ordinances. The Eltham Ordinances are effectively a great long list of rules that were drawn up by Cardinal Wolsey on Henry VIII's command to reform the royal household. But what's fascinating about them is that they give us an insight into Henry's psyche. One of the things that's really clear here is just how bossy Henry is. He instructs here that the people in his privy chamber shall be loving together and of good unity and accord. So, in other words, go about your work with a smile. And, perhaps more importantly, keeping secret all such things as shall be done or said in the same privy chamber. I mean, this is basically a gagging order. If you're working for the king, then don't speak about what you see or hear in the privy chamber. But for Cardinal Wolsey, the Eltham Ordinances serve another purpose entirely. 
Wolsey had an ulterior motive. He wanted to control the people who were getting close to the king. He wanted to ensure that other people couldn't bend his ear, and as it says here, not intermeddle of causes or matters. In other words, the people who are close to the king should not be talking politics, and they shouldn't be trying to move up in the world. So this is really something of a political coup at the same time as it is a book of rules for how the household should behave. The Eltham ordinances helped Wolsey to become the most powerful man in England, other than the king himself. But there are signs that Henry feels the cardinal is getting too big for his boots. Wolsey runs a court that is spectacular. You know, when he holds parties at Hampton Court, there are hundreds of people there for dinner. But it's also getting to a point of almost competing with Henry himself, and that's a bit of a problem. Henry starts to look more closely from time to time. They have the odd little clash. I mean, Henry was always in charge, even when he was just leaving things to other people. A real indication of Henry's growing unease with Wolsey's status comes over the issue of Hampton Court. Wolsey knows that Henry's a bit jealous of it. And when he realizes that he's starting to lose Henry's favor, he makes this very symbolic gesture of giving it to the king. As his relationship with Wolsey begins to unravel, Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon is falling apart. One of the deep-seated things in Henry's character is that if something goes wrong, it's always somebody else's fault. And so Henry does start to blame Catherine. After the birth of the Princess Mary, their only child, there are no more living children. And then, of course, Catherine is almost six years older than he is, and she's going to enter the menopause, and that worries him. Throughout his reign, Henry has this problem, which is that he's king, he's meant to be in charge of everything, he's meant to be able to decide his own fate, and yet there are so many places in his life where he then discovers he's not in control of things. He's not in control of whether his wife has a son. A queen is there for one principal purpose, and that is to produce sons. Catherine's not doing that, and therefore, you know, he's bound to, he's bound to look elsewhere. Henry's attentions are turning to a young woman at court, Anne Boleyn. He's had affairs before, but this time, things feel different. Anne plays things slightly differently. As soon as it becomes apparent that Henry is considering the validity of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, she starts positioning herself as the potential future bride, and Henry is quite happy to go along with this. And so they start on this attempt to get Henry's marriage to Catherine declared invalid. Desperate to end his marriage, Henry starts searching for a way to divorce Catherine. Once Henry's decided that he wants to marry Anne Boleyn, he goes all guns blazing to research this himself. He gets it into his head that the reason he has no sons is because he has transgressed that biblical rule in Leviticus that you must not marry your brother's widow. The thing about Henry is, once he has his mind set on a particular course, he can be extraordinarily cold and ruthless in achieving it. And anybody who gets in his way, well, they need to watch out. Henry tasks Wolsey with securing permission from the Pope to end his marriage. With the divorce, Henry gives Wolsey an impossible job to do. Divorce isn't unheard of, but for a king to set aside a wife to whom he had been the Pope is going to agree. And Wolsey must be thinking, I've got the boss from hell here. I just cannot deliver this. What am I going to do? Wolsey's attempts to secure a divorce are failing. Losing patience, Henry takes matters into his own hands, and he initiates a very public trial of his marriage to Catherine. From Henry's point of view, the divorce trial should have been a way to sort things out and get a legal ruling to get his own way. But the Queen comes in, she gets down on her knees before Henry and she makes this extraordinary plea to her husband, asserting her role as his wife, pleading for her rights to stay in the marriage. He doesn't react. There is nothing. He's not at all swayed by all of this emotion. This is an indication of that coldness just coming to the surface in Henry's character. It's almost like when he's decided that somebody is no longer useful to him, that's it, he cuts them out. He moves on to the next thing. It's almost pathological. 
the divorce trial ends in failure, and Henry blames his chief minister. Wolsey has genuinely tried to get Henry the divorce he wanted. And it's not really Wolsey's fault that this has not worked out. I mean, the big balance of power is against him. And yet, in Henry's mind, Wolsey has failed in the most significant diplomacy that Henry has ever asked him to do. There was this invisible line which Henry drew. Once you cross that line, you will pay the penalty for doing it. And there's no going back. You can't rub out history. Once you have annoyed Henry, once you have damaged his ego, you will pay for it. And Wolsey knew his days were numbered. Henry VIII has turned his back on his wife and his closest advisor. And strange quirks are emerging in his character. If you actually met Henry VIII, it would be important not to fix your eye upon him for too long or stare straight in the face, because he, he really didn't like that. It, it was said of him he couldn't hold somebody's gaze. He felt uncomfortable. This is one of the strongest kings of England, and yet there's a certain personal insecurity, even when he's at his most secure. Henry has this tendency to turn on his most trusted advisors. He puts them in impossible positions, given these incredibly difficult tasks. And when they fail, as inevitably they must, they get all the blame, not Henry. Henry banished them. Once the king's most powerful subject, Wolsey is stripped of his post as Lord Chancellor, and his property is seized. For Cardinal Wolsey, who always saw himself as Henry's man, to have the king say that he didn't trust him was completely crushing. And from that moment on, we don't ever really see him regain Henry's trust. He is just slowly sliding inexorably towards his ultimate fate. Wolsey sends Henry a letter begging for his forgiveness. This letter, held in the National Archives, gives an insight into Wolsey's desperation. Wolsey is appealing so completely submissively to Henry in this letter that it starts with, I, your poor, heavy and wretched priest, do daily pray, cry and call upon you, and then ends with, your most prostrate, poor chaplain, creature, creature, I mean, not even a human being anymore, just a sort of beast of King Henry VIII. It could not be more clear in this that Wolsey is lowering himself in Henry's eyes. It really is quite heart-wrenching, I think, that he was reduced to this. The Cardinal's letter fails to win the king over. I find Henry VIII quite challenging <laughs> because time and again, Henry can't admit himself that he's made a mistake. He's completely certain that he is in the right at all times. And so as a result, the person who gets scapegoated is Wolsey. Henry issues orders for Wolsey to be arrested on charges of treason and sent to the Tower of London. But he will never make it there. After arriving at Leicester Abbey to spend the night, he collapses and dies. In the aftermath of Wolsey's death, one of his servants goes to see Henry to try and persuade him to look kindly on his old servant. This is when we see Henry's contradictory nature, because Henry declares, if I could lay out £20,000 to bring back the cardinal, I would gladly do it. In the next breath, he reminds Wolsey's servant that his master had died whilst owing him £1,500. After Wolsey's death, it becomes clear that the Pope will never grant Henry a divorce. But Henry is so determined to marry Anne Boleyn that he will stop at nothing to achieve it, to break with the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. He didn't want to be responsible to the Pope. He wanted to centralize power to himself. It was the only way he would get a divorce. It was the only chance of having a son and heir. 
Henry has started to radically change the course of English history. He transformed every aspect of his kingdom, religious, political, but he's developed into a very different man. He's moved from being someone who's a bit anxious and uncertain to someone completely convinced of his own rightness, the justice of all of his decisions. He was willing to change the entire country, even the entire map of Europe, in order to get what he wanted. In the next episode, Henry turns on his new queen, Anne Boleyn. The English court is a nest of hissing snakes. Absolutely nobody is safe. This reads, her crimes were so abominable. Anne is the most wicked queen in history. And Henry's paranoia begins to creep into England's politics. Henry VIII comes down on opponents with murderous force. You're either with him or against him. And if you were against him, you paid for it. That's Bloodlust and the Berlins next Wednesday at 9. The potentially heart-stopping dangers of an asthma attack. Pulled into focus tomorrow night at 9 in brand new 999 Critical Condition. New next, the 20-year hunt for the killer. Newsreader Jill Dando shot outside her house in West London. It was a crime that shook Britain. In just a moment. You might think you know everything there is to know about Henry VIII. You'll know he married six times and had two of his wives executed. But the truth about our most famous king is much more complex and far more compelling. This series tells Henry's story over six of the most tumultuous decades in English history, separating the real man from the myth. To some, Henry was a cruel bully. He wanted the theater of punishment to be perfect. This is what happens when you defy Henry. This is what traitors get. To others, he was a charismatic and successful ruler. He jousts, he rides, he sings. What more could you want from this perfect prince? But Henry's personality, his innermost thoughts and his motivations have remained elusive. Pathological. Once Henry has his mind set on an idea, he will stick with it no matter the consequences. Now a team of Tudor experts have come together to investigate who the real Henry was. Here are Henry's insecurities written in black and white. They'll unearth never-before-seen documents, including some from the Vatican's archives. Thank you so much for showing me one of the greatest prizes in Tudor history. And they'll go backstage at Henry's court to unravel a murky world of power, plots and petrifying ambition. Henry VIII comes down on opponents with murderous force. Henry's growing increasingly paranoid. He's starting to lose his grip on reality. Henry has got older, he's got more tyrannical, his reign has got bloodier, and he's more determined than ever to get his own way. Henry VIII is now 41 years old. His first wife, Catherine of Aragon, has failed to provide him with a longed-for son and heir and he's becoming increasingly anxious about the future of his dynasty. He's banished Catherine from court and is embroiled in an attempt to divorce her and marry his long-term mistress, Anne Boleyn. The way in which Henry is treating the two women in his life could not be more different. On the one hand, you have this great chivalrous love play with Anne Boleyn, and on the other, there is the incredible cruel, heartless rejection of Catherine of Aragon, the wife who served him loyally for more than 20 years. It's interesting to think what it was about Anne Boleyn that made her so attractive to Henry, but also so enigmatically attractive to so many people. Her education in France may have been a factor. She had a style and a glamour that other people didn't. But also her intelligence, her ability to argue with scholars and theologians about religious and moral issues. Henry, the scholar who flattered himself as being the philosopher prince saw in her, I think, a consort who shared some of those values. 
But as their relationship develops, Anne puts pressure on Henry by refusing to sleep with him until their wedding is in sight. Her own sister had been discarded as Henry's mistress. She wanted more for herself than that. She wanted to be queen. So for seven long years, she keeps him at arm's length, giving him a little bit of encouragement and then destroying his hopes the next. That speaks volumes about just how much Henry was enthralled to Anne. They survive to this day and are held deep within the Vatican Library. Regina, thank you so much for allowing us to film here and for showing me what has to be one of the greatest prizes in Tudor history. These are the original letters from Henry VIII to his great love, Anne Boleyn. You're very welcome, and we are happy to show people in Great Britain these documents so precious to you and to us, and precious for, I think, all mankind. Henry's letters are written in French, the language of courtly love, and are filled with romantic gestures. You can see that in French, to my mistress there. At mistress. The top of the page. <laughs> he wishes. <laughs> and, you know, he talks yes. about being struck by the dart of love or dart d'amour. Now, this, this is very famous, isn't it? The, the love heart. It's very romantic that he draws a love heart around Anne's initials yes. and then either side are his own yes. initials. And even though we don't have Anne's responses, we can sense that she's the one in control because <laughs> it's all Henry yes. making the effort and trying to woo her. Yes. And she's remaining just out of reach, which I think was part of her genius, actually. Yeah. The letters demonstrate just how desperate Henry is. The longer Anne holds him off, the more insecure he becomes. This is probably my favourite of the letters because I think it's the most revealing of Henry's state of mind. You sense his insecurity in a way because he talks of how he's been in a great agony uh, since receiving Anne's last letter, not knowing how to interpret it. Here is a man who has showered his love with affection, with letters, with gifts had very little back. One of the naughtiest letters in the whole collection uh, is this one here, where you really get a sense of Henry's frustrated lust. He writes to Anne, wishing myself, especially of an evening, in my sweetheart's arms. Here's a man in torture through this unrequited love. Anne's not giving him much back. Henry doesn't know where he stands, and it's sending him crazy. Anne Boleyn's behavior and the desire for a male heir have provoked Henry into making one of the most monumental decisions in English history, breaking with the Roman Catholic Church. Eventually, free from the Pope's authority, Henry divorces Catherine of Aragon and marries Anne Boleyn. But all of this comes at the highest imaginable price. Henry's break Rome was probably the most devastating political and religious and social event for 500. To reject the authority of the Pope and everything that that represented was something which disoriented, terrified everyone. The nation was traumatized. Henry then declares himself head of his own Church of England. For Henry to claim to be the head of the Church was unprecedented. It's very hard to imagine the radical, shocking nature of that claim. A layman, not someone in the church, not a bishop, not someone in holy orders. Henry believes this makes him second only to God. On the one hand, you need to have quite a big ego to deal with that. On the other hand, it's a great deal of responsibility. Henry, who is already trying to manage a kingdom, is now trying to manage a church as well. So at the point that Henry breaks with Rome, I don't think anybody quite knows what is going to happen next. Henry might have got his wish to marry Anne Boleyn, but this revolutionary decision is about to catapult England into chaos and damage Henry's reputation with his people. England is in turmoil after Henry's decision to break with Rome. But despite opposition, he is now ruthlessly forcing the new religion on his Catholic people. To push his religious revolution through, he has a secret weapon in the form of his new chief advisor, Thomas Cromwell. 
Thomas Cromwell is nothing less than a genius, talented lawyer, he's a property developer, a money lender, a trader. But Cromwell is very different to the noblemen that Henry's surrounded by. Thomas Cromwell was the son of a lowly person in Putney, just down the river from London. And he had this unique ability to annoy people, uh, particularly the rich nobility of old England, who regarded him as a common upstart because he wasn't from the great and good families. Men like Cromwell owe everything to Henry's readiness to put them in place. So they really suit Henry because they're going to be loyal to him. Henry is really drawn to Cromwell. He's got a cheeky sense of humour. He's not afraid of Henry. And as a natural bully, Henry is actually rather disarmed by that. He was ruthless, ambitious, and quite happy to tread on anyone who got in his way. Cromwell seizes the opportunity to win favour and hatches a plan to make Henry rich. He's worked out that England's monasteries possess millions of pounds in untapped wealth. Of all these monasteries, and it's all going to go straight into your pocket. Kings are always short of money, and that was music to Henry's ears. Henry wanted to be the richest king in Christendom. It's all about his image for Henry. He wants to have the most magnificent court to put one over on his rivals, such as the King of France. I'm not sure Henry's greedy. I think that Henry feels that as king, it is his right to be in charge of everything. To justify this making scheme, Henry and Cromwell start a slanderous propaganda campaign against England's Catholic monasteries. If you're going to dissolve the monasteries, you have to have an excuse to do it. So Cromwell and his agents go around, they start drawing up lists of things that the monks and nuns are doing wrong. Monasteries were always controversial places. You know, these were houses of celibate men living on their own, often in remote, inaccessible places. Who knew what they were doing? Protestant reformers are saying not only are these places of idolatry, but they're places of sexual sin. They're superstitious, they're monsters. It's quite astonishing that the first piece of explicit legislation against sex between men comes in in 1533, precisely in the context of this campaign. They find it useful to say, you know what's going on in these monasteries? This is why we need a crackdown. And so they use this not just to attack the monks, but to close down the institutions altogether. They say things have got so bad, we've all got to go. Under Henry's orders, hundreds of monasteries across the English countryside are pillaged and destroyed. Henry closed in the region of 563 monasteries. That's an enormous amount. These buildings had dominated the English landscape for centuries. They were almost like the social services of their day, fulfilling the role of hospitals, a charitable function. And so, of course, their loss had a huge impact on Henry's people. This one report that suggests there's 20,000 monks and nuns wandering around the country homeless. That just gives you an indication of how much of a shake-up of society this was. Henry had pledged that all of the income from these religious houses would be invested in creating new, reformed religious establishments. He didn't keep his promise. He gave away a lot of the riches, a lot of the lands to his nobles, and he kept an awful lot for himself. 25 years into his reign, Henry has come close to destroying the Catholic Church in England and made a fortune in the process. But remarkably, in private, he's still clinging on to the traditional Catholic beliefs that he grew up with. While in public, he's outlawing all sorts of things, such as going to mass, in private, that's exactly what he's doing. The Catholic Mass is at the heart of Henry's religious beliefs and really at the centre of his life, and he attends Mass every single day. We know he crept on his knees to the cross at Easter. These are in the views of most Protestants, superstition. But Henry was convinced they weren't, you know, superstition with the things the other people did. These things were true belief because in his heart he was performing them in the right way. There is an enormous double standard with Henry. It's all very well for him to continue worshipping as he likes, but his people have to toe a different line. They have to be part of... 
on their own, often in remote, inaccessible places. Who knew what they were doing? Protestant reformers are saying not only are these places of idolatry, but they're places of sexual sin. They're superstitious, they're monsters. It's quite astonishing that the first piece of explicit legislation against sex between men comes in in 1533, precisely in the context of this campaign. They find it useful to say, you know what's going on in these monasteries? This is why we need a crackdown. And so they use this not just to attack the monks, but to close down the institutions altogether. They say things have got so bad, they've all got to go. Under Henry's orders, hundreds of monasteries across the English countryside are pillaged and destroyed. Henry closed in the region of 563 monasteries. That's an enormous amount. These buildings had dominated the English landscape for centuries. They were almost like the social services of their day, fulfilling the role of hospitals, a charitable function. And so, of course, their loss had a huge impact on Henry's people. This one report that suggests there's 20,000 monks and nuns wandering around the country homeless. That just gives you an indication of how much of a shake-up of society this was. Henry had pledged that all of the income from these religious houses would be invested in creating new reformed religious establishments. He didn't keep his promise. He gave away a lot of the riches, a lot of the lands to his nobles, and he kept an awful lot for himself. 25 years into his reign, Henry has come close to destroying the Catholic Church in England and made a fortune in the process. But remarkably, in private, he's still clinging on to the traditional Catholic beliefs that he grew up with. There's a real contradiction in Henry's attitude towards the religious changes, while in public, exactly what he's doing. The Catholic Mass is at the heart of Henry's religious beliefs and really at the centre of his life, and he attends Mass every single day. We know he crept on his knees to the cross at Easter. These are in the views of most Protestants, superstition. But Henry was convinced they weren't, you know, superstition of the things the other people did. These things were true belief because in his heart he was performing them in the right way. There is an enormous double standard with Henry. It's all very well for him to continue worshipping as he likes, but his people have to toe a different line. They have to be part of the new reformed religion. But Henry's religious hypocrisy is testing some of his closest friendships to people like Thomas More. Thomas More's relationship with Henry VIII was as close to a friendship as a Tudor king could have. Uh, they argued long into the night. They talked about the latest works of philosophy and religion. They went up on the leads of the palaces and looked at the stars and talked about astronomy. They'd first met when Henry was just eight years old, so Moore was a huge influence on Henry, and he rose and rose in Henry's service. He was Lord Chancellor of all England by the 1530s. But Thomas Moore was acutely religious, uh, devout to the point of wearing a hair shirt under his clothes so that his flesh was mortified by the irritant. I mean, these were the kind of extreme religious practices that the most reclusive Catholics would use. As a devout Catholic, Thomas More disagrees strongly with Henry's decision to break with the Roman Catholic Church. And he's not the only one. Growing numbers of people are speaking out against Henry's new regime. These voices of dissent play heavily on Henry's insecurities. Some outspoken priests in Middlesex said that Henry's private life resembled a pig uh, wallowing and defiling it. Self. A nun makes these prophecies saying that she's seen a place reserved for him in hell. For Henry, this is all deeply personal. Anyone who speaks out against his reforms is criticising himself, and he can't take that. Like his father before him, Henry VIII comes down on opponents with murderous force. Hidden away in the Houses of Parliament is evidence of just how murderous Henry is becoming. Here I am in the parliamentary archives looking at the 1534 Treason Act, one of the most extraordinary documents in Henry's reign. 
Here are Henry's neuroses, Henry's fear. The 1534 Treason Act says it's now high treason to maliciously wish, will or desire by words or writing or by craft imagine an attempt of bodily harm against the king or the queen or their heirs apparent. This document says that it's now high treason to be maliciously publish and pronounce by express writing or words that the king is a heretic, schismatic, tyrant, infidel, or usurper of the crown. The act is extraordinary because it's not only governing how people behave, but it's governing how, how they think and what they say. Henry VIII believed that as far as his subjects were concerned, you're either with him him and if you were against him you paid for it this document changed Henry's realm into a land of fear words spoken in jest or in drink or in anger could lead you to the scaffold this brutal act significantly widens the scope of treason and it marks a turning point in Henry's reign that need not only to have people obedient but to believe absolutely the justice of what he was doing was unprecedented. No one had asked this before. And that is intruding into everyone's belief system, into their consciences, in a way that no one had tried before or since. One of the first victims of Henry's ruthless new regime is his old friend, Thomas More. Henry locks him in the Tower of London because More refuses to endorse his religious reforms. More is very much a devout Catholic, and that idea of England breaking completely away and defying the Pope, defying tenets of Catholic faith, is not something that Moore can really live with. Moore remains in the tower for a year, and during that year, Henry does everything he possibly can to persuade him. He even says to him, believe what you like in your heart, so long as in public you're with me. I think Henry still had that deep felt conviction that eventually their friendship would prevail, and that would be won over by the sheer weight of argument and the force of Henry's personality. Tudor history is full of these moments where people who have been working together for months and years suddenly fall apart. But I think it's particularly traumatic when it comes to Henry and Thomas More because of that deeper intellectual connection that the two of them had forged. Eventually, Henry has had enough, and he authorizes his former friend's death. The Parliamentary Archives still holds the document that sanctions Thomas More's execution. This document says that Thomas More, contemptuously refusing to take the oath supporting the succession to the crown. They are powerful words. And later on, they describe the ingratitude of Thomas More towards the king. It lays down Thomas More's crimes and leaves his execution. In all intents and purposes, it's his death warrant. On the 6th of July, 1535, Thomas More is executed on Tower Hill. I can't help but wonder whether Henry just had those moments where he looked at himself in the mirror and thought, how on earth have I come to this? Here he is, ordering the execution of some of his closest friends and advisors. He's caused turmoil in his kingdom. Did he ever bring any of that back on himself and actually examine his own motives, his own character? I don't think Henry had a conscience about what he was doing. No, he's not a man who's going to lose any sleep over things like that. He has an objective which he wants to achieve, the continuation of the dynasty and nothing or no one is going to stand in his way he absolutely believed in the righteousness of his own conclusions and that's what drove him through there's definitely a sense at this point in henry's reign that it's almost gathering a momentum of its own there's no stopping henry now and it's going to get more and more brutal little does henry know that a freak accident is about to alter the future of his kingdom and the fate of his second wife
Henry VIII is now 44 years old, and his break with the Roman Catholic Church is beginning to tarnish his reputation. He's desperate to project the image of a king at the height of his powers. In the middle of the 1530s, Henry was a man increasingly obsessed by his public image. He would spend many hours getting dressed by his men, covering up all those signs of weakness and projecting this idea that here is the most magnificent king ever to sit on the throne of England. Henry, from the beginning, is very conscious of the importance of the public eye, but also he really enjoys it. He loves performing to people, being the monarch. You have to look the part. And Henry is particularly adept at this really interested in fashion. So we have records of Henry spending 75 pairs of shoes in one single 12-month period. Henry is the ultimate investor in, dare I say, bling jewellery. But beneath the royal clothing is a king who is far more vulnerable than he looks. Concerned he's losing the love and respect of his people, Henry's propaganda machine goes into overdrive. Having broken with Rome, it was really important for Henry to win some hearts and minds if he's going to avoid a big rebellion. It involves a certain amount of PR effort using print, which is a pretty new technology to produce lots of pamphlets and trying to win back some of that popular support. It's not easy to get a country to break away from a faith that it had as a part of its way of life for centuries beforehand. So that trauma of separating from the Catholic Church is something that Henry has to respond to directly. Whilst Henry hopes to escape public unrest, he can't seem to avoid it in private. Henry develops an increasingly bad temper because he's losing patience with Anne and with this marriage and also the fact that he hasn't yet to produce a male heir and so he just now wants results. Henry needs God to show him that he approves of his actions by giving him a son. And yet Anne does not produce a son. She has miscarriages, she has a daughter. It's as if his first marriage is, is, is just repeating itself. And that worries him. What's wrong about this marriage? Is this marriage cursed as well? As time went by, there were more reasons for them to dispute and argue with each other. Her inability to produce the male heir was the grumbling resentment, but also her commitment to religious reform, her willingness to argue with Henry. These things were things that over time became more annoying than attractive. The real turning point for Henry is when Anne accuses him in public of having an affair behind her back, and Henry is angered that she would dare question him in public about his behaviour. Henry responds to Anne by telling her that she needs to turn a blind eye to this behaviour as her betters had done, meaning Catherine of Aragon, and that he could unmake her just as quickly as he had raised her. There's another person causing trouble inside the royal marriage. Henry's advisor, Thomas Cromwell. Henry's court has become like a pressure cooker. So at the center of this, we have Cromwell and Anne, who are each other's rivals and enemies. Anne has her own faction behind her, and Cromwell has his supporters. And we see in the court these two rival factions fighting for Henry's attention. So he was very keen to act against her, to strike first before he was attacked himself. Anne has an ace up her sleeve that she thinks will secure her position. She's pregnant. However, something is about to happen that will shake both Anne and Henry to the core. When Henry takes part in a jousting tournament, he falls from his horse. An account from the time reveals that the accident is so serious that Henry is knocked unconscious. There's a report by Dr. Pedro Ortiz, who is the Imperial Spanish ambassador to the Vatican. Uh, he's picked up some gossip coming in from Francis I of France, who's no friend of Henry VIII. The French king had said that the King of England had fallen from his horse and had been for two hours without speaking. So here we have Henry lying on the ground, not speaking, for uh, two hours. I believe the horse rolled on him, it crushed him. He suffered some kind of traumatic brain injury. 
recent research has demonstrated that such an injury can actually cause neuroendocrinal damage. People suffering from this very rare disorder become depressed, irritable, and very suspicious of everyone around them. In the latter years of Henry's reign, he was displaying all those symptoms. Henry's accident also has a dramatic effect on his wife, Anne Boleyn. What is absolutely certain is the shock of hearing that Henry had this accident caused Anne Boleyn to miscarry a male child. Queen Anne was brought to bed and delivered of a man-child before her time. It was said she took a fright. It was a three-month-old fetus, a male child, perfectly formed. Uh, and and if, if the child had lived, it could have been Henry's longed-for male heir. The miscarriage is a personal disaster for Anne because that possibility that the male heir was finally at last about to appear is taken away again, and she's damaged goods. After his accident, Henry becomes increasingly paranoid. And at court, things are now more dangerous for Anne Boleyn and Tom Cromwell. There is a diplomatic letter which describes the English court as a nest of hissing snakes. There are eavesdroppers at every corner. Absolutely nobody is safe, from the queen to the greatest statesman of the country. Around Easter 1536, we see a real shift now between the relationship of Cromwell, publicly disgraces him, and this now puts Anne back on the chessboard, and so she removed Cromwell, her rival, and once again, she's the centre of Henry's world. Cromwell storms out, and the first thing he does is to start plotting to get rid of Anne. Cromwell has decided it's Anne or him, and it's going to be Anne. Secretly, Thomas Cromwell launches an investigation into Anne's behaviour. As soon as he's left court, Cromwell puts the word out that he's sick. But Cromwell is far from sick. He is using this two-week absence as the perfect cover for him to start plotting the downfall of his arch-enemy, Anne Boleyn. Cromwell has this incredibly sophisticated network of spies and informants. Among his network are a number of ladies from the Queen's own household. Now, Anne isn't popular with her ladies. She's a fairly cruel mistress, so you might imagine how willing those ladies are to give Cromwell little tidbits of gossip, information that he can slowly craft into a case. One of the things about the early modern court is that it is based upon flirtation, and it's based upon the language of courtship. So at any point, those acts which could have been perfectly normal are reinterpretable as much more culpable. If you'd say you loved the Queen, what do you mean? Cromwell began to find a lot of evidence of people saying inappropriate things. Just two weeks later, Cromwell presents his findings to Henry. When Cromwell had to go and tell Henry what he'd discovered, it must have been the most terrifying moment of his political career. To say that the king's wife, his queen, was adulterous, I mean, that's not news you can pin in a list of other things as you're going through the morning's business. Cromwell's evidence accuses Anne of conducting an affair behind her husband's back with not one, but five men. He had to take control of that, and he took control of it with a ruthless passion, a rage that meant that it had to be driven through, that there was no escape. This is a man not in denial, but in manic acceptance of the charge, and I think that's what drives the process from there on in. When he wanted something to be true, it became true. And this was absolutely the case now with his second wife's infidelity because her real failure, let's be honest about it, was not giving Henry a son. That was the only way she let him down. I don't believe she was guilty for one moment of lenience. In the archives of the British Library is a letter that provides a glimpse into Henry's mind during this time as well as the man manipulating him, Thomas Cromwell. 
This is a letter by Thomas Cromwell written in May 1536 at the height of the controversy surrounding Anne Boleyn. This letter is undoubtedly one of our best sources for understanding Henry's perspective on Anne Boleyn. Cromwell says here, the King's Highness thought convenient that I should advertise you of the same. I should tell you about what's been going on, about the case against Anne. Really, what he's saying is the King has instructed Cromwell to spread the word about Anne Boleyn's crimes, and they are all described here in their full gory detail. This bit here reads, her crimes were so abominable that I think the like was never heard. And there's some fairly graphic language used here to describe the Queen's incontinent living. This is written for an absolute purpose. It's telling the world Anne Boleyn is guilty of heinous crimes. Anne is the most wicked queen in history, according to Cromwell. Alongside charges of adultery, Cromwell's letter also accuses Anne of plotting Henry's death. At the bottom we have here talk of a certain conspiracy against the king. So in Henry's mind, it goes beyond just adultery and unfaithful wife. She's plotting treason. This is a pure piece of PR on Cromwell's part. Cromwell manipulated Henry, and in fact, he later boasted that he had dreamt up the whole scheme against Anne Boleyn. Whatever the truth behind the accusations, Henry falls for them, hook, line, and sink. Once convinced that there was a kernel of truth to it, Henry's imagination knew no bounds, and at one point, famously, he said, well, Maybe it's a thousand men. Who knows what Anne is capable of? Henry VIII is a great fan of good stories. He's good at spinning them, and he is also taken in by them. And the story that is spun around Anne is the one of the wicked woman, a woman with an insatiable desire to manipulate men. Henry orders Anne's arrest, and she is escorted to the Tower of London. He will never see her again. Tower of London. Reports suggest that Henry VIII is becoming mentally imbalanced. The Spanish ambassador reported that Henry had collapsed in tears about Anne Boleyn's downfall. Henry VIII was always an extraordinarily emotional man. Tears were never far from the surface. Tears of joy, tears of grief. But of course, Henry always cries only for one person, and that person is Henry himself. For a Tudor men not being able to control your wife is really seen as the cardinal sin and the biggest flaw against your masculinity. I'm sure that Henry did believe Anne was guilty because it was convenient for him to believe that Anne was guilty. And it made him right. He was the good person, she was the bad person. While Anne is under lock and key, the investigation into her infidelities ramps up. This letter was written by uh, Sir William Kingston, who was Anne's jailer at the Tower. And Kingston had been set upon uh, Anne as a spy by Henry. Henry wanted to know her every move, her every word. Kingston reports this overheard uh, conversation uh, between Anne and Henry. Norris. Norris was actually one of the gentlemen who served the king, but he was also a great favourite with Anne and stood accused of adultery with her. Anne asks Norris why he would tarry before getting married. Why is he waiting to get married? And she says the following throwaway remark, did he look for dead men's shoes? Effectively, she's kind of teasing Norris, saying, are you waiting for the king to die so that you can marry me? The fact that such a throwaway remark, harmless in itself, was enough to condemn a Queen of England shows you just how febrile the atmosphere was at Henry's court. The king himself was growing increasingly paranoid. He's starting to lose his grip on reality, and that is all reflected here in this piece of evidence against Anne. Based on this evidence, Anne is tried for treason, found guilty, as are the five men accused of sleeping with her. 
Henry does not attend Anne's trial, but he is heavily involved in the plans for her execution. He wanted the theater of punishment to be perfect. He wanted the execution to be exemplary. This is what happens when you defy Henry. This is what traitors get. Henry didn't ever like to associate himself with death. He wouldn't go to funeral, and he didn't want to be seen in the same space as Anne Boleyn ever again. Her name was not to be mentioned. All trace of her was removed from his palaces. So, of course, he's going to be nowhere near the tower that day. But he invited a 1,000 people to watch Anne Boleyn's head being struck off. Those are the actions of a madman. On the morning of the 19th of May, 1536, Anne Boleyn is executed. But Henry has already lined up his next wife. The speed with which Henry moves on to wife number three, Jane Seymour, is deeply disturbing, really. The very next day, they are betrothed. They're married 10 days later. Now, that is fast, even by Henry's standards. He needs to get cracking because, you know, he needs to have a son and he needs to um, live long enough for that son to grow to adulthood. So he's not going to waste time, you know, pretending to mourn a woman who's betrayed him. The following year, Jane Seymour is able to give him what his two previous wives have not, a healthy son, an heir to the throne. Tragically, Jane herself dies only two weeks after the birth leaving Henry once more alone. But his reign is far from over. The England of the late 1530s is entirely different from the England of a decade before. We've got the monasteries being dissolved. We've got a dramatic change of personnel at court. All sorts of people have disappeared. Thomas More is gone. Anne Boleyn has gone. Jane Seymour has gone. Henry himself has got older, he's got more tyrannical, his reign has got bloodier, and he is more determined than ever to get his own way. In the next episode, age and infirmity start to catch up with Henry VIII. The pain that Henry got from his leg was absolutely huge. When the leg was really bad, he could turn black in the face and just sort of lie, still hardly able to speak. And he turns on his close advisor. Those less admirable traits that we'd seen hints of early in his life are now front and centre. This is Henry as a tyrant. This is the beginning of a totalitarian state. That's Henry VIII Endgame next Wednesday at 9. Dangerous weather, empty stations, unique challenges. 2020 captured in the new series of Paddington Station 24-7. Back on the tracks Monday at 9. Next, from Freddy's humble start in Zanzibar to the Charles Shopping stadium filling powerhouse, Queen, the band that rocked the world in just a moment. You might think you know everything there is to know about Henry VIII. You'll know he married six times and had two of his wives executed. But the truth about our most famous king is much more complex and far more complex. This series tells Henry's story over six of the most tumultuous decades in English history, separating the real man from the myth. To some, Henry was a cruel bully. He's clever. What he likes to do is to trap people. He's a very skillful manipulator. Henry's punishment was exemplary in its brutality. To others, he was a charismatic and successful ruler. He jousts, he rides, he sings. What more could you want from this perfect prince? But Henry's personality, his innermost thoughts and his motivations have remained elusive. Henry didn't take the blame for his own mistakes because that would not have worked for him as a king. He was so good at convincing himself of what he saw as the truth. Now a team of Tudor experts have come together to investigate who the real Henry was. If you ever needed proof that Henry bit of a megalomaniac. This is it. And they'll go backstage at Henry's court 
to unravel a murky world of power, plots, and petrifying ambition. The English court is a nest of hissing snakes. No one quite knows who to trust. There are spies and informers. It's very, very clear that behind this public facade was somebody who was fundamentally vulnerable and insecure. Henry VIII has been on the throne for 28 years. And the once carefree prince has become a paranoid king, suspicious of everyone around him. He's divorced his first wife. He's executed his second. And his third wife has died after the birth of his only son. Now Henry is alone. His controversial break with the Roman Catholic Church is making him unpopular and there are rumblings of dissent across his kingdom. Feeling increasingly vulnerable, Henry commissions a portrait designed to promote himself as a formidable ruler. This is the iconic portrait of Henry. This is what everybody sees in their mind's eye when they think of Henry VIII. The silhouette of that figure could identify him just by itself at us, he looks like a mighty emperor. It's no coincidence that the codpiece is at eye level. You can't fail to notice it. It's sending out a message that Henry is this great virile king. Everybody knows all the problems he's had getting a male heir, but this painting sets the record straight. None of that was Henry's fault. The painting presents Henry as a powerful monarch in total command of his country. But this portrait is a that picture is propaganda. We know that it's been changed to make his legs look longer, to make him look more muscular. But in reality, Henry was slumping into geriatric decay. It's an image of Henry that he wishes the world to see, not the actual Henry, the sick Henry, the overweight Henry, the Henry that's suspicious about everybody and that's also the effects of the infirmity of age and the oncoming march of death. Henry is suffering from a painful leg ulcer, which deeply affects his state of mind. Sometime in the 1530s, Henry suffered a jousting injury, which caused a terrible, debilitating, agonizing disease in both his legs. Tudor medicine was rather basic. So he's has advised that his wound would be kept open, which meant that he smelled, that his bed sheets stunk, his clothing stunk. This is a man that you could smell before you saw. The pain that Henry got from his leg was absolutely huge. When the leg was really, really bad, he could turn black in the face and just sort of lie, still hardly able to speak for, you know, for several hours on the trot. The infection had to be released, which meant the leg often had to be open and pus drained and ointment stuck on it. There was a lot of decaying flesh and they wanted to remove that by cauterizing it with red or irons or plied to these wounds in his leg. It must have been a living nightmare for him. Henry's increasing infirmity, his ailments, had a profound effect on his psychology. He couldn't cope with the knowledge that he's no longer this kind of thrusting young King he had been, he's turned into this incredibly vulnerable, pain-ridden old man. Henry's infirmity is laid bare when you look at his private household accounts. So there are these primitive lifts to move Henry between the floors of his apartments. He's wheeled about in a chair. He has a whistle to summon his attendants. Henry thinks that he knows how to cure his leg ulcer better than his a 16th century manuscript contains 32 medicinal recipes that Henry concocted himself. Most of his recipes are concerned with pain in the legs. So here's a plaster devised by the king at Oxford to ease the pain and swelling about the ankles. I would not use some of the ingredients today. The king's grey plaster, for example, contains various roots, flowers, garden worms scraping 
of ivory and powdered pearls. And finally, it also contains red lead, which is deadly poison. Do not try this at home. The exact nature of Henry's health has been subject to speculation. Recent research suggests that he suffers from a rare condition which affects his mental health. Down the centuries, people have had lots of different uh, theories about what was the matter with Henry VIII. I think Henry suffered from a hormonal disorder called Cushing syndrome. In 20% of cases, it turns the victim into a suspicious person, wary of everyone around them. They become melancholy, uh, depressed anxious, they can't take a decision, they'll change their minds continuously. Now, all these symptoms Henry displays in the latter years of his life. Other historians attribute Henry's increasing paranoia to diabetes. There's a lot to be said for the view that um, as he became more and more obese, he, he, he got type 2 uh, diabetes. I mean, it can start to affect your mind and you, you can you sort of develop elements of paranoia and he Henry certainly has elements of paranoia in these last years. Whilst Henry's body and mind are starting to fail, his enemies are gaining in strength. There are reports of a huge uprising in the north of England and Henry has to act swiftly if he's to keep control of his kingdom. Henry VIII is now 46 years old. His painful leg ulcer has transformed the highly active king into a man who struggles to even walk without assistance. This lack of exercise, combined with massive overeating, are making him obese. And there are detailed records of the enormous quantities of food. Uh, on pretty much any given day of the week, we have everything from swan and custard through to rich roasted baby kid or lamb. There's butter and eggs, there's jelly and hippocras. Porpoise and seal for the king's delight. But it's been estimated that King Henry VIII would have been having about double the number of calories, bare minimum, that you would recommend in the 21st century. Because Henry was eating so much meat, he inevitably suffered severe constipation. And there's an account in the letters and papers of King Henry VIII of how one of Henry's physicians actually had to come and administer a clister, that is an enema, as we'd call it today, to the king in order to try and flush out his system. And the document goes on to proudly report how the king got up in the middle of the night and had a fair siege on the toilet. Delightful for all those around him, obviously. Henry always saw himself as that beautiful young prince he had been once, universally adored as a sportsman, an athlete, a renaissance prince. And I think he found it very difficult towards the end of his life, as what he saw in the mirror was no longer that handsome young man, but instead undeniably a sort of slightly hideous sort of old creature. It's three years since Henry broke with the Roman Catholic Church and declared himself head of the Church of England. But now the repercussions of his religious revolution are catching up with him. Down the centuries, people have had lots of different uh, theories about what was the matter with Henry VIII. I think Henry suffered from a hormonal disorder called Cushing syndrome. In 20% of cases, it turns... The repercussions of his religious revolution are catching up with him. This radical move is extremely unpopular and results in a religious uprising in the north of England known as the Pilgrimage of Grace. This was the first major rebellion against Henry's Reformation and it shocked him to the core. Because he was so good at convincing himself of what he saw as the truth, he thought his people still loved him. This now changed everything. The whole point of the Tudors were that they brought peace and union to England after the divisions of the Walls of the Roses. And now you have division again. This is an epic failure of kingship, and Henry understands that, and he is extremely concerned. But with no army at his disposal, Henry is unable to defeat the rebellion with brute force. Kings of England never had standing armies, so they had to rule 
uh, with the consent of the people, he realized that he was he was in a very dangerous situation now and he needed to act tactically, politically. He offers them a pardon and invites their ringleader, Robert Ask, to a secret meeting. Henry has this masterstroke. I mean, he invites Robert Ask and the leaders of the pilgrimage to court and he entertains them for Christmas. He gives them gifts and looks after them. Ask went away very happy, saying, He'd enjoyed every sign of the king's grace, of his mercy. What a fantastic king, Ask is essentially saying. But it soon becomes clear that Henry's show of mercy is a trick. And he turns on the rebels with a vengeance. Henry was the sort of ruler who would gull you along and then basically cut you off. He's clever. But what he likes to do is to try and trap people, move them about on a chessboard. He's a very skillful manipulator. Robert Asks returns home, and Henry orders his arrest and execution. Henry's punishment of Robert Ask was exemplary in its brutality. This is a message to the people that this is what happens when you oppose Henry. And in fact, he wanted to go much further. He wanted people from every village involved in the rebellion to have somebody executed. But the man who was in charge of the retaliation simply didn't carry out Henry's orders. Henry's ruthless suppression of the rebels marks a turning point in his reign. England had changed an awful lot during this period. It was no longer the merry England of Henry's early years. It was now pretty much a totalitarian state. There were spies everywhere. Suddenly, nobody was safe. Nobody could trust anyone. There were neighbors informing on neighbors. So you never knew when there was going to be that on the door. People were now afraid to open their mouths in any public place. People were afraid to write letters and express an opinion because they were always looking over their shoulder. The man responsible for enacting Henry's crackdowns is his chief minister, Thomas Cromwell. Cromwell has previously masterminded the breakup of the monasteries engineered the downfall of Henry's second wife, Anne Boleyn. But now that Henry's people are turning on him, he shifts the blame onto Cromwell. Henry didn't take the blame for his own mistakes because that would not have worked for him as a king. One of the purposes of good servants was that they would take the blame if things went wrong. It was their advice. With the Pilgrimage of Grace, they didn't attack Henry so much, they attacked Cromwell. There is definitely a sense in which Thomas is Henry VIII's scapegoat. Henry could step back and say, I'm innocent of this. I don't know what's going on. There had been warning signs for Cromwell for a few years now that actually his luck was changing. There were arguments with the king. And in fact, on a number of occasions, the king was said to have benevoled Cromwell. He was beating him up in front of the court. On one occasion, pommeling him about the head as if he were a dog. Cromwell must have been terrified. <laughs> As he starts to fall out of favour, Cromwell is given the chance to redeem himself. It's been two years since the death of Henry's great love, Jane Seymour, and now Cromwell is tasked with finding him a new wife. He's now got the heir, but you know he doesn't have the spare, and Henry is deeply sceptical about female monarchy. He's not excited about the prospect of either of his daughters becoming his successor. So he's looking for a new wife to produce sons. Cromwell strikes a political deal for Henry to marry the German noblewoman, Anne of Cleves. And Henry agrees to marry her based solely on seeing her portrait. Well, he sees an image of a girl who looks like a doll. She's pretty, she's young, she looks very unthreatening. So Henry sees the portrait and he thinks, well, she looks a bit of all right. Um, I'll, I'll go for that. Yeah, that seems, that's fine. But when Henry meets Anne in person, he changes his mind completely. When Anne arrives, she's put up in Rochester Castle, and Henry can't wait to see her, so he goes in disguise with a gift to basically have a quick peep. But actually, Anne doesn't really take any notice of this rather obese uh, stranger who sort of pops by, and um, that, that's not a good start. Poor Anne of Cleves was dressed in the most hideous German costume, with sort of contrasting bands of fabric and a sort of helmet 
object that looks like something out of Star Wars. And uh, he was horribly disappointed. Henry made his revulsion towards Anne of Cleves absolutely clear. He complained that there were displeasant airs about her. And there's a very lurid description of their wedding night. And it gave him enough of a conviction to declare that she was no maid. Henry's smear campaign against Anne of Cleves actually reveals more about his own personal insecurities than anything else. Henry has for some time been suffering from bouts of impotence and he finds himself unable to consummate the marriage. I think perhaps he has a, a bit of a go, it doesn't work out, and then he decides, this is not my fault. Really, it undermined his masculinity that he couldn't have sex with his own wife, but he was not willing to acknowledge that it was his problem. As far as he was concerned, it was her. Henry's PR campaign against Anne was so effective that even centuries later, enough to get rid of quite quickly. We completely overlook the fact that actually there's probably nothing wrong with Anne and frankly, Henry was no oil painting by this time. The Anne of Cleves marriage is an unmitigated disaster and Henry lays the blame squarely at Cromwell's feet. I don't think Henry really turns against Cromwell until the Cleves marriage. When Henry feels that somebody has him or has been working against him, he feels that the scales have fallen from his eyes and he's going to do something about it, and so he will cut them off. And you know, he's got this infinite talent for turning loyal servants into enemies of the state, and Cromwell falls into that bracket. Seeking to exploit the growing rift between Henry and Cromwell, Cromwell's enemies at court start to plot against him. Chief among these enemies is Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk. Well, Thomas Howard, 3rd Duke of Norfolk, he's been one of the most unpleasant men in English history. He was ambitious, vain, arrogant. For Norfolk, Thomas Cromwell was public enemy number one. Norfolk thinks that Cromwell's you know, too big for his boots. He's a self-made man, he's not an aristocrat. The country should be run by people of noble blood, the true councillors of the king, not these sort of upstarts. To remove Cromwell from power, Norfolk starts a campaign aimed at discrediting him. It doesn't take much to stoke Henry's suspicions. Norfolk claimed that Cromwell was plotting to marry the king's daughter Mary, make himself king. He pointed out the fact he had this huge household that could perhaps turn into a private army and take the throne by force. There was literally no evidence behind any of the charges, but Norfolk knew Henry was so paranoid that he would believe it. Henry was thinking if Cromwell has let him down, have meant it. He must have been in some way acting cruelly to the king, and Henry's ego was particularly precious and particularly vulnerable where he thought he'd been betrayed. For Cromwell, it's only a matter of time before Henry turns on him. Thomas Cromwell knew the end was coming. He could smell it. He must have constantly been over his shoulder, not knowing who to trust. Henry finally gives the order to strike. And when Cromwell arrives late at a Privy Council meeting, the Duke of Norfolk is waiting for him. We don't know why he was late. It might have all been part of the plot, but he thought it was Jing. He didn't know this. When he moved to sit down, Norfolk said, Stop! That's not the seat for a traitor. Cromwell was frozen. He must have been absolutely terrified because he knows where it ends. When the guards rushed forward, there was a cry of traitor and he was seized. He was astonished and he said, well, why are you calling me a traitor? Tell me what the charges are. Nobody said a word because they hadn't finished making those charges yet they had no answer there's a moment that's almost shakespearean where the duke of norfolk rips the chain of office from around his neck this method of arrest has been devised deliberately to surprise and shock him he was dragged out and taken by boat to the tower of london on that dreadful one-way ticket
Henry VIII has been on the throne for over three decades. After ordering the arrest of his chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, Henry's suspicions intensify. So after Cromwell's fall, Henry is actually a rather different character because he starts to say for the first time, I trust no one but myself. He doesn't appoint another chief minister. And, you know, people have said, oh, these are years without a policy, you know, no one was up to the job. No, 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 no. Henry believed he was up to the job. He was going to direct everything. He was so sensitive to any accusation that he was being governed by other people, that other people were manipulating him, that he was the plaything of other people's ambitions, that he did everything in his power to try and assert himself as the ultimate authority in the kingdom. Even though Cromwell is now his prisoner in the tower, Henry still needs his former advisor's help. Henry remains trapped in his marriage to Anne of Cleves, and he needs Cromwell's legal expertise to get him out of it. There's nobody else who can get him out of this fiasco marriage with Anne of Cleves. So Henry's writing to Cromwell asking for his help. You know, give me evidence that the marriage uh, was never valid, that it could be annulled. So Cromwell is working for Henry till his very last breath. I think that he believes that the king at some point is going to turn around and say, sorry, all is forgiven. This is a mistake. I'm going to release you, live out the rest of your years. Um, we're going to find a place for you somewhere. But once the Anne of Cleve... Something like Thomas Cromwell isn't a friend. He's a human tool of whatever it is that Henry wished to achieve at any moment. And so he will pick a tool up and he will use it, and when it no longer serves its purpose, he will cast it aside. On the 28th of July, 1540, Thomas Cromwell once one of the most powerful men in England, is led to the scaffold and publicly executed on Tower Hill. With Cromwell out of the way, his arch enemy, the Duke of Norfolk, sees an opportunity to secure greater powers for himself. And he has a secret weapon to help him, his teenage niece, Catherine Howard. <laughs> The moment that Catherine Howard is in the king's bed, Norfolk probably thought he was absolutely made for life. I mean, Norfolk was a cynical, unpleasant career aristocrat who beat his wife, knocked her teeth out. I mean, this was not a nice man. So the fact that he was using women as pawns in a political game shouldn't surprise us. You like it here. Norfolk's position is secured when Henry takes Catherine Howard as his fifth wife. He seems to rediscover something of his lost youth in her. He adores her and is seen playing with her in public. So he feels himself to be this young king again. He wanted to prove to everyone around him that he was a virile man. And I think that his caressing of Catherine Howard, his constant parading her about this place as this young bride on his arm, just massive overcompensation. He's old enough to be her grandfather, so they must have presented this rather incongruous image of Beauty and the Beast. But Henry and Catherine's honeymoon is short-lived. After just 15 months together, evidence emerges that Catherine wasn't a virgin when she married him. On the 2nd of November, 1541, Henry VIII was at mass up in the uh, King's Closet, just above us here in the Chapel Royal of Hampton Court Palace and he was presented with a letter from Archbishop Cranmer that relayed the sordid details of Catherine Howard's past. And it explicitly says in this account that Cranmer didn't just tell the king this information, but instead put it in writing. He declared the information thereof to his highness in writing. Because, as it says here, he had not the heart to express the same to the king by word of mouth. This account makes it very clear that Henry was completely heartbroken when he discovered this news. It says his joy was turned to sorrow. He wept bitter tears. And you get this impression of someone who really, really wanted this marriage to work, who was deeply in love with Catherine Howard, and whose world just came crumbling down around him when he found out the truth about her. It's against Catherine intensify. And she is accused of having an affair during her marriage to Henry. The moment he learned about this, the moment he learned that it was true that she had had an affair, he left. And that's what we see Henry doing time and time again in his relationships. 
It's quite disturbing that Henry has this capacity to just sort of turn off and move on from a person, even one who clearly he loved very deeply. Catherine Howard's fate is clear the moment Henry turns against her. She is beheaded for treason at the Tower of London. Catherine was just a girl who had been taken advantage of by men for most of her life, who ended up dying very bravely, but very horribly. After Catherine Howard, Henry was left with the reality of an aging man who's losing his virility. There is a sense of deep unhappiness that this is what he now has to live with, this, the wreck of the prince he once was. Despite five failed marriages, Henry only has one legitimate son. So he embarks on his sixth marriage to Catherine Parr, hopeful that she will provide him with a spare heir. But Henry's also increasingly concerned about his imperial legacy. And for a Tudor king, that means only one thing, going to war. He's trying to recapture his lost youth, and he tries to do that by going off to war. He's going to be this great crusading king again, reclaiming parts of France. Henry grew up on tales of daring do against the French. Henry V, Agincourt, and all those other famous victories. Henry had always wanted to have military glory in his portfolio of achievements. In this period, the English nobility want to go smashing up the French, you know, just like 21st century tourists want to go, you know, around northern France on holiday. Here at Windsor Castle is a treasure that epitomizes Henry's image of himself as a warrior king. In the latter years of his reign, Henry specially commissions this suit of armor. Here is the physical embodiment of Henry's childhood dreams, the symbol of chivalry and the image of an armored man, Henry VIII's armor. Now, armor in the 16th century was made to measure, none of this off the peg stuff. It provides us with the true image of Henry as he would like to be projected, of power and might and you can almost imagine his little piggy eyes behind that visor, glaring at us with contempt. Actually enlarged to accommodate his increasing size. Here, they're having to let in five centimeter plates on each side of his back plate because of his expanding girth, because he did weigh 28 stone. Now, in National Health Service terms, his body mass index was way off the day's scale. He was a man mountain. In order to make him feel more comfortable and to flatter him, his male courtiers start to wear enormous padded doublets and clothes so that they appear just as big as the king. This also affected Henry's psyche. I think he was really humiliated by what he had become. Henry's very aware that his advancing years and medical disorders threaten to derail his battlefield ambitions. So, while he still can, he personally launches an assault on the French port of Boulogne. I mean, his idea of leading his army in person, of course, means directing operations from a safe distance inside a, um, a sort of wooden pavilion which is lined with fake marble inside. He is like a small boy with lots of toy soldiers. He is in his element. He loves the siege. He loves all these cannonades which fire day and night. It was an attempt to gain glory by conquering France again. It was an attempt to resurrect the idea that England would be mighty by ruling over France. Henry's attack on Boulogne is a success and he enters the captured port as a conquering hero. But his vanity project has a serious impact on England's economy. Henry painted the capture of Beloit as a great victory, but it cost them enormous sums of money. And in fact, England became bankrupt by the cost of war. Five years after Henry died, a Tudor accountant was given the task of calculating how much the wars had cost. He produced a 16-page account which showed that it had cost the poor English taxpayer, equivalent in today's money, 1.87 billion pounds.
pounds. And it shows the burden which his subjects had to bear to pay for his hopes of military glory. Despite plunging England into bankruptcy, Henry's military ambitions do have some benefits. Henry's military legacy was enormously positive. Yes, he'd depleted the royal treasury in the process, but he'd created one of the greatest navies in the world and also an incredibly impressive army as well. He'd made England a power to be reckoned with. And so you had to maintain the appearance of a strong king, able to deliver justice, able to lead the nation in war. These were the things that united the realm. Henry would have been seen as a good king because a king who leads to victory in a war is a good king, almost regardless of anything else. But just after Henry secures the military legacy he's always dreamed of, his health takes a turn for the worse. As his health deteriorates, Henry takes to shutting himself away in his chambers. The last years of the reign are definitely tainted by claustrophobia. You know, no one quite knows who to trust. And of course, because of his immobility, Henry is closeted in a secret study at the far end of Whitehall Palace and doesn't come out that much. People think that, okay, he's sort of switched off. This is not the case. I mean, this is somebody who is almost like uh, in his lair, he's checking up on everything. A good way to view Henry would be as a rather malignant spider at the centre of everything which went on within England. All those lines of the web all run through and end up with him. It's becoming clear to Henry's courtiers that he's nearing the end. In the last days of Henry's life, the atmosphere at court must have been pretty toxic. There was a sense of fear, of anxiety, of uncertainty for what the future would hold. There was a real sense, I think, that the end was coming for King Henry VIII. But no one is brave enough to mention this to Henry himself. The dying king is, like a dying lion, extraordinarily dangerous. Everybody was terrified that Henry still had the power to kill. It was said that no one would give him any official advice because they were frightened of his reaction. Imagining the death of the king was treason. So in a capricious reign where people had been charged with treason for all kinds of offences, simply telling the king that he might die is not something that even the bravest counsellors would be able to do. The only thing to say to a king is, it's a scratch, you're sure to get better. Tomorrow we'll go hunting. Everything will be fine. As Henry's health gets worse, the finishing touches are put on one of the most important documents of his reign his last will and testament. It reveals his attempts to retain control over his kingdom, even after his death. This, very excitingly, is the last will and testament of... This is Henry's last ditch attempt at controlling the future of England. If you ever needed proof that Henry was a bit of a megalomaniac, this is it. An enormous proportion of this will is taken up with the thing that had concerned Henry right from the moment he acceded to the throne, which is the succession to the dynasty of the Tudors after Henry died. It's not a surprise that, of course, what Henry most wants is his son Edward to become king after him, but perhaps he himself was a second son, he provides for the possibility that Edward might die. In other words, even on his deathbed, Henry is still trying to claw his way into control beyond the grave. Even more extraordinarily, given that Henry, as I say, is dying at this point, he provides for the possibility that there might even be another wife in his future. Any lawful wife who I shall hereafter marry. I mean, that is rank optimism in the face of all possible evidence, I would say. I think there's something almost tragic about this king on his deathbed who has striven for nearly 40 years to have absolute power over the people in his country. And now, in his dying moments, he's still trying to do that. He's still trying to maintain control. And there's something moving about that, almost admirable, uh, and also slightly repulsive, if I'm completely honest.
Henry is growing so ill that he's started to drift in and out of consciousness. When Henry was on his deathbed, he must have felt that his dynasty was coming to an end. Henry wasn't in a position to pass on his crown to another stable male monarch. His son, Edward, was still very young. When Henry knows that he really is now going to die, he must have been wondering if he was going to end up on the right side of things with God. I mean, he was Christ's deputy on Earth, but he was also going to be judged, and Henry must have been wondering whether actually he had quite got things right. Henry was now presiding over a realm divided in which religion had become an irreconcilable grievance. Henry's lifetime as king had seen the creation of a divided England, and that was a genie he couldn't put back in the bottle. Henry's courtiers finally muster the courage to warn him of his approaching death. There was a great deal of tension in the court. Who was going to tell the king that he was about to meet his maker. Eventually, the task fell to Sir Anthony Denny, who in life had fulfilled Henry's most intimate needs as groom of the stall. Now he had one last service to perform. Asked Henry, effectively, if he wanted to make his last confession, should I send Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury? And Henry replied and said, I will first take a little sleep, and then, as I feel myself, I will think on the matter. They were the last words he ever spoke. On the 28th of January, 1547, Henry VIII dies. Henry VIII has gone down in history as our most famous king, probably because he's our most married king. He's a kind of larger than life character. But it's very, very clear that behind this public facade was somebody who was fundamentally vulnerable and insecure. The story of Henry VIII has everything in it. It has transition from young, irresponsible being to someone blighted later in life by paranoia. Henry was self-obsessed, desired admiration. He could never be wrong. You cannot ignore Henry. He put England in the centre of European politics. But he also gave the English a sense of national identity. England was never going to be quite the same after Henry. He'd broken with Rome. He had centralised the kingdom. Institutions like Parliament, the Church of England, hardly changed for another 400 years. Henry was tremendously charismatic. He knew how to be a king. He understood the myth of English kingship. I think if you looked at Henry VIII's reign as a whole, you would have to accept that it had been a reign that changed the state of England forever. With the upcoming elections in the States, we take a look at the big history of America, brand new on Saturday at 9. Next tonight, one of the most narcissistic killers ever, Mick Philpott, in Five Mistakes That Caught the Killer.
Henry VIII is born on the 28th of June, 1491. But he's never meant to be king in the first place. He's the spare heir, living in the shadow of his older brother, Prince Arthur. As the second son, the younger of the princes, comparisons could be made with Prince Harry. In fact, Henry was known as Harry for much of his childhood, and there are some similarities physically as well. He was allowed, really, to be a little bit wilder, to indulge his favourite pastimes. He just didn't have the same pressures as his elder brother. Henry clearly sees himself as the spare rather than the heir. Uh, I suppose in some ways that might be liberating, but in other ways it might nurture a certain jealousy. But Henry later in life has this urge to prove himself all the time, to show that he, he can be a success, even at his most... Well, ...attendants spoilt him and made sure that the hard knocks and bruises of boyhood weren't inflicted on their charge and anything he wanted he got as the second son Henry is ignored by his father and instead raised by his loving mother in the protective female world of Eltham Palace Henry's relationship with his mother was unusually close his mother seems to have taken a real care for the of her son. For a royal princess to grow up in this sort of environment wasn't that unusual. For a royal prince, however, it was a little bit strange, and it just goes to show how unimportant, really, Henry was considered in the line of succession. But when Henry is just 10 years old, something happens that transforms his life. Unexpectedly, his older brother dies, leaving him as heir to the throne. He's not the second son, he's the first son, and he's going to be King of England. It's hard for us to imagine the pressure on him, the idea of having to take up that position. To make matters worse, Henry's beloved mother, Elizabeth of York, dies just months later. Recently, this remarkable survival from Henry's childhood has been revealed to us, and it's incredibly exciting, because for a long time, it was thought that this was just old page and an illuminated manuscript. But when we look behind this figure of King Henry VII here, we see King Henry VIII as he later became as just a boy 